It is now 410 and I am Phyllis Hildreth, the chair of the Metro Human Relations Commission and I welcome you to the opening of our monthly full commission meeting. Um, we will proceed by way of the agenda that those who are in the room have before you. We'd like to welcome our citizens and viewers who may be viewing this online, live stream, or at a later time. Uh, for those of you who are not present with us, you should be able to find a copy of our agenda on the Metro Human Relations Commission website. So with that, let us begin. Uh, I guess that was the call to order. So our next item of business is the review and approval of minutes. Commissioner, you have the minutes before you. They were also mailed in advance, hoping that you have had an opportunity to read them. I'm working off of the wrong agenda. That was the executive committee. So I missed the confirm, confirm the quorum. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We are a body of 17, that means quorum is confirmed. With that, we will move to item number three, review and approval of the minutes. So minutes before you, assuming that you've had a chance to review them, is there a motion to accept and receive the minutes as published? Move to approve. Second? Second. Is there any discussion in terms of corrections, deletions, omissions, additions? Hearing none, call for the vote. All in favor who would accept these signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Minutes are approved. Next, we will move to the financial report, asking our executive director, Mel Fowler Green, to give us that report. Yes. Um, in a uh, green paper in your packet, um, much like uh, last month, we are. Um, running below our budget. Um, we did not have any extraordinary expenses in the last month. Um, I will say, though, that bear in mind, as reflected on this spreadsheet, the second pay period for February has not um, been accounted for. So we've actually spent um, about $10,000, no, actually about $16,000 more 13,000 rather, more than what is reflected because both set, uh, payroll and fringe have not been accounted for yet. Thank you. Are there any questions about the budget? This is an item that does not require action at this time, so we will receive it into the record. Thank you. Next agenda item are committee reports. First committee being the executive committee that met here in this room at three o'clock previous to this and as the commissioners may remember from two meetings back, we agreed that the executive committee would begin the process of getting us back on a calendar schedule of reviewing the performance of our executive director. So with that understanding, we devoted this session to that task. The evaluation instrument that you used and approved two years ago, the last time we reviewed, was uh, submitted filled out by the executive director in the way of a self-evaluation. She gave numerical responses to each category. She also gave us a brief overview of her work. Each of the commissioners on the executive committee had an opportunity to question or comment about each category. We then dismissed and went into partial executive session where the executive director had a chance to add any other information or concerns that she had about her staff that may have been private privileged information. Following that, we excused the executive director and we collected the numerical responses from your commissioners. Those are being tallied in summary. They will be provided back to the executive director. The next step is during this month, both members of the executive committee and the executive director will respond to some of the comments that we made in our session about how can we quantify the work going forward, what benchmarks might we have, what are specific items of action that we would like to look at going forward, picking up on issues that were raised at our last staff um, commission retreat, which was September of 2016. Is there anything we missed? Do we need to pick up? All of that will come back into 
be crafted into an action plan for the executive director for the year of 1819 going forward and along with the summary numerical values those will all what did I say? 1819. <laughs> Fiscal year 2018-2019. That's kind of budget speak. Okay. We're going to be doing that later as our... I teach I'm, so, I'm sorry. That. Yeah, you teach history. Right? Well, that was the old public administrator coming out in me. So when that and the historian, we had a moment there. Right, so for 2018-2019, that fiscal year, that the full commission in general and the executive committee in particular will have a very specific roadmap by which we can all do our work and then evaluate our work this time next year when we get back on track. So that would be, and that was the only business we undertook in the executive committee. Are there other committee reports from other chairs seated at the table? Were there meetings in the I'll past? I say due process was supposed to meet. We didn't uh, settle on a date because we're trying to follow up on uh, Commissioner Ali's uh, comments about the, the bullying a couple months ago. So we just need to get that done this month. Thank you. Any other reports? All right, hearing none, thank you. We will move on to new business. And our new business for this particular meeting is a segment that we have entitled, We Serve the City, Charting Our Course for Education and Advocacy. This commission has been very diligent in trying to hew closely to its legislative mandate, not only the city ordinances that created us and allow us to be funded and do our work, but the original impetus for that work being the 1964 civil rights legislation, specifically Title VI within it, which in summary, often I read that into the record, I'm just gonna summarize right now, is, is the work of this city, its services and its provisions being provided to all the members of the city in a manner that is fair and equitable, equitable without regard to race, gender, class, and all sorts of categories, right? That's basically it. So if we want to know whether we are doing the work fairly, we have to know what the work is. What is the baseline? So there is this very basic need to have a level of civic education. First, for the 17 commissioners, all of us come from very diverse backgrounds. We don't always know how all corners of city government work, but more importantly, for the people we serve. And so this will then be the third in our series this year. This is our inaugural year. The first was uh, hearing from the resilience officer of the city, the second being hearing from both the elected public defender and the elected prosecutor jointly helping us understand the money bail system. And this month we will be looking at the budget system. And our commissioner, Janice Rodriguez, is the session um, convener for this particular educational piece. We thank um, Commissioner Rodriguez, we thank her guests, we thank all of you for once again being committed to the task of good citizenship and good governance by informing ourselves and arming ourselves with the information we need to do the work that we are tasked to do in serving this city. So with that, I turn it over to uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. Thank you very much. Um, I um, am indebted to Executive Director uh, Fowler Green for the uh, procuring the talent that we have today, the presenters that are going to speak to us specifically about the uh, how the Metro budget process relates to the mission and mandate of the commission. Uh, however, their presentation may be a little bit more broad than that and uh, we will give them latitude to, to give us a good overview, but looking specifically at how we how the commission inter interacts, what what we can do, how we can get involved in the process, and other other questions that you may have. And with regard to question, the process that we have set up is that they'll uh, ideally a 30-minute presentation, give or take, whatever whatever um, they have come prepared to give to us. 10 minutes for questions specifically from the commissioners and those don't have to be uh, logged ahead of time, but if there are additional content-related questions that anybody here uh, participating in the forum would like to 
uh, pose to the group. We will provide 10 minutes for that. There is a clipboard at the end of this table if you'd like to sign up to make sure that your questions are heard uh, and that they're content related. Uh, we'd love to have your name so that we know uh, for the record who, who who's speaking with us today. So uh, all, all of that is welcome. Now our, our panel today on the budget process, I could uh, I, if let Mel uh, introduce them specifically. She works more directly with them within the Metro budget process. So I will go ahead and she was she was instrumental in, in, in getting them to speak to us today. So I'll turn that over to her for a moment and then we'll go forward. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to have with us today um, some uh, a few folks that I get to work with. Um, uh, Jean Nolan is the Deputy Director of Finance. Uh, Tony Niemeyer is the Assistant Director of Finance and Dustin Owens is our own budget analyst. So I get the, um, the great opportunity to work with Dustin on a regular occasion. So um, if you all are prepared and uh, we're gonna let you take over. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> <clears throat> Let me uh, begin by sort of giving you what I consider to be our approach to the presentation we put together here. Um, I want to take a minute, when, I, when I'm in a group like this, I like to give you a little background of myself, and uh, then we're going to go into letting Tony, who is the budget officer for Metro, uh, kind of go through the process itself. Uh, Dustin's here because if we get a chance, we'd like to share with you a tool that kind of gives you an example of how budgetary decisions are made and uh, hopefully he can get through that. Uh, so let me just begin, uh, first of all, to say one of the reasons both Tony and I are here together is because the finance department's in transition, has been since uh, Mayor Barry's election and the appointment of our uh, deputy director, Talia Lomax O'Neill, to finance director. Uh, I was also a deputy finance director and we've replaced Talia's position. And Talia, as uh, deputy director, was also doing the uh, work of the budget officer. So when all this changing occurred, we brought in an interim budget director for the first year and then brought Tony in last year uh, to be the uh, budget officer for the city. So our approach, or what I'm hoping to do is sort of give you a perspective from both ends. Uh, me from sort of the longer end of being involved in Metro and Tony newer uh, mainly to finance, but uh, he's been in Metro government for quite a, a bit of time, but not quite as long as me. Uh, so my history is, is I was born and raised here in Nashville, and I uh, saw the creation and implementation of Metro government while I was in high school. And uh, when I came back uh, from graduating from college, uh, I started a career with Metro in uh, 1972 as a budget officer, I mean, as a budget analyst in the finance department, and that's where I've spent my whole career. Uh, my, it's my belief that Metro and government encourages one of the most unique citizen-centric uh, approaches to civic involvement and participation, uh, primarily because of the metropolitan formation, which is a consolidated city-county approach. And um, I'm more or less gonna be here to provide some general uh, observations of why I think that belief to be true and how, what the opportunities are. But since we were asked here to give a presentation on what the budget process is, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony, let him go through this budget process, and then if we got the opportunity, I'll kind of explain why I think metropolitan government provides such a citizen-centric approach to government. Tony. 
Thank you, Jean, and we really appreciate that. I think that I could speak, if I might, on behalf of the full commission, that that is um, a point that I think that this body is particularly interested in. So, thank you. I might just to share some of those thoughts. <laughs> Thanks, Jean. Um, with me today, as, as Mel introduced, is, is Dustin. He'll be involved a little bit later. Uh, I moved down south in the early 90s from Michigan. I think we're from the same <laughs> close area in Michigan. So uh, I moved to Alabama, went to school there, migrated back up to Tennessee. My wife is from Florida. She doesn't want to move any further north than Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, so I started in Metro in 01, started an internal audit. I actually audited the uh, Human Relations Commission back in 02 or 03. Mm. So I've, I've actually done work from the, from the department side, from the audit side. Um, we stayed in internal audit till 2007, went to the water department, and I was there as our CFO for 10 years before coming here to, I guess, backfill Talia's role after the interim, I guess is the best way to say that. So this is my second budget year. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, I've, I've decided after, I, we're going to address your questions, we're going to go over the budget, I'm going to hit the rules, because that's really what kind of puts everything together. So we're going to discuss the charter requirements. That really is going to lay the foundation for everything. Then we're going to go into the, the budget timeline. I decided to break it up into four different phases. Um, then I'm going to specifically, there was a list that I think it was six questions. I'm going to address each one of those specifically, okay? And then the last part, we're going to introduce the, the tool that we think is one of the, we've, this is the third year we're using it, but really maybe the second year. Uh, it's a tool that we use that citizens can actually get involved with the budget. Uh, as technology gets better, this is one of those things I think we can reach out and get people involved. Uh, we're going to track the responses. I'll show you that when we get to it. All right, I'm going to read a little bit because I think it's important to kind of put those rules and those foundations in place before we start getting into the timeline. I think everybody knows the fiscal year. This is all in the charter now. This is Section 6 uh, from July 1 to June 30. Everybody understands that. Uh, the responsibilities of the finance director to distribute all forms necessary to complete the operating budget. Okay, that's the finance director. Uh, director of finance can revise any estimates provided. Departments are entitled to meet and discuss those changes, and we do do those meetings, and I'll get into that later. Uh, when the budget is complete, the director of finance shall provide an estimate of the unencumbered fund balance and deficit for the upcoming year. When the budget is complete, the director of finance shall provide a reasonable estimate of revenues and expenses. That's for all the departments and all the revenue sources together. And those estimates must include debt service. That's on our long-term debt. Now, I'll answer questions specific to some of these stuff, if, like what is this or what is that. We saved your substantive questions until the end, and we'll, we'll have time for those. Uh, mayor shall review the operating budget submitted by the Director of Finance and make any revisions. So you've got, I'm establishing a legal kind of trail here where I'm, I'll get to my responsibilities here too in a second. Director of Finance to the Mayor, okay? No later than May 1st, and this is a charter deadline, the Mayor shall submit to Council the operating budget. So now it goes to the, from the Mayor to the Council. The mayor shall make copies of the budget available with the message in the summary budget, but published in the newspaper. And remember that we have a balanced budget here. We have to, revenues have to equal expenses. So everything has to balance. Still in Chapter 6 of the Charter Requirements, after approval of the budget ordinance, the Council shall hold hearings for both the operating and capital budget. They shall be advertised, the Council hearings shall be advertised in the newspapers again. And they shall approve it by June 30. I'm using the word shall there because there's, how many attorneys are in the room? Shall is one of those <laughs> things that you shall do. It's not recommended or anything like that, okay? May. And if the council doesn't approve the budget that's submitted by the mayor, the mayor's budget goes through. All right, this is where the fun begins. This is, there's a lot of things that we do in the budget office that I'm not going to go over that are just more task oriented, but I'm just going to hit the high points for you guys. The first phase of it is what I like to call the budget communication. This is where we get, get together and talk. Um, this is where we meet with departments and we start communicating what the goals are for, for the upcoming year. That could happen at various times. It doesn't have to happen at one specific time of the year. It's just going to be towards the end of the calendar year going into the next year, next months. You'll get, we'll provide general instructions for everything that you're supposed to do. This is when we met with Mel, I think, in November this year, and we went over mm -hmm. 
This is where we talked about the, the status quo budget and things like that. The second part is budget preparation. This is where we'll provide the departments a schedule for uh, the, the revenue, for capital and the operating expenses to all the departments. We'll compile, we'll, we'll send it out to the departments, they'll send it back into us, either they'll enter it into our system, it's called Hyperion, it's online, it's a system to gather the budget information. And we'll put it all together, of course there's back and forth where we interact with the departments to make sure that the numbers are bright and we'll confirm that with them. And then we'll typically hold a second meeting. This is where you'll either meet with me again and we'll go over your budget submission and any other issues that are out there. Or you'll meet with the director of finance and do the exact same thing. It's just really a preference of the director of finance. Um, during these meetings, we like to get people ready for the mayor's meetings, um, the format structure, what you need to be prepared for, what you need to go over. Um, so that, that's really what we try to do there to make sure that we're, we don't want to send the department, any department, and this, this just doesn't go for this department, it's any department, into a situation where they don't feel like they're prepared. So that's really what we're trying to do is prepare you, the department, to get ready for the next step. All right, phase three. This is the budget delivery phase, I called it. Around March or, a March or April, we'll get everything together for the director of finance, and we'll get it. Remember I talked about director of finance? mayor and council this is that step right here and that's when after that then the departments will meet with the mayor and go over the budget now and i didn't really mention the capital budget and i'll be happy to answer questions on that but there is a deadline by the commanding the planning commission has to approve the capital improvements budget that's really it's a huge document if you go out there and look at it it's huge they've tried to tie it in with nashville next so there's a connection between what the city wants to accomplish long term and what the budget requests are. Um, it's really one year, which is the current year, and then five years of additional time that's really used as a planning document. It's not really, uh, you know, everything's not set. It's just that one current year that's set. So in this year, it would be 2019, 2020, 21, 22, and so on. Those would just be placeholders, really, in planning. It's just the current year that, that you really use it for. But we have to, we gather that at the same time we're gathering all the other budget information in the beginning of the calendar year. May 1st is the, again, I remember back in one of the other slides, I said May 1st, the mayor has to present the, here it is again, I'm, I'm reinforcing that. We file the budget ordinance, that's the initial one, on May 1st, that is required. That's when we'll work late nights putting everything together. Because uh, that's all the last minute changes and everything's gotta be done. Uh, that's the fun stuff. Um, and then May 15th, the CIB is filed with council. That's that big document. And I didn't mention this, I'm gonna go back to it. I, I don't know how, how much you guys have had interactions with Metro in the budget process, but from the capital improvement budget is generate a capital spending plan. That's actually what gets spent. So just because it's in the capital improvement budget does not necessarily mean it's gonna get done. You still have to approve the spending authority for it, okay? Budget approval. May and June, the council will take everything we've given them, capital, operating budget, ordinance, everything. We'll create a budget book for them, uh, and they'll review all that information. That's when they start holding their hearings. One of the things that's very important and, and that I always like to bring up, I did a presentation to the mayor's office, to their staff, um, and one of the points I really hit home with them is that the finance director is responsible for establishing the revenues for the government. Council can't go in there and change that. They can categorize things, different, but they, they can't change that. That's, that's that role's responsibility. So once that's kind of set, it's set, okay? June 30 is the deadline for the budget approval. Again, that's a charter date. They can approve it any time after they receive the recommended budget, but must do so in June 30. Remember, this is the, I'm kind of building in the rules into the kind of our process. If they don't approve the budget, if they get it in May 1st and they don't do anything with it, then her budget becomes the final budget. It gets adopted. That's it, but if they do, typically we call it a substitute ordinance if the council goes in and makes a few changes. There was a handful of changes last year to the budget. 
um, that it ended up coming the budget ordinance, the substitute budget ordinance. All right, this is the part where I'm gonna actually specifically address your questions that were asked. And what I tried to do is keep this from the budget perspective, trying to think of what you guys are really asking and trying to work in that information. So I've tried to, again, I'm, I'm just gonna repeat some things, but it, it, it's kind of what it is. It's kind of what we do. Uh, our first thing is, what is your unit authorized to do? Well, it's really from Article 6 of the Charter, really defines everything that the Department of Finance does, everything. All of our people, our roles and responsibilities, fiscal year, who's responsible for the police completion of the budget. Again, I'm responsible to help the finance director, assist the finance director of finance, prepare the budget, who goes to the mayor, goes to the council. The scope of the budget, all the different parts of it. That's, that's all defined in there, the due dates, as we've mentioned already, that's, that's all in there. Reviewed and recommended by the mayor, submitted to the council, that whole process is in there. Approved by council, that's in there. So all those roles, the budget preparation are, are defined right here and what, and what we're authorized to do. I'm going to pause just in case someone wants to ask a question. Okay. What is your unit authorized to do? This is, again, I'm going to keep going. This is continuation. Article 8 specifically defines my specific responsibilities, what I'm responsible for doing. I report to the finance director compile under their supervision all the data for the budget. That's, I mean, that is, it's a line item in the charter. Just examine department agency performance. We do that all the time. We were just doing that just recently as last week. Um, look for improvements. We do that all the time. We're constantly looking for improvements. Report to the mayor, finance director, and department heads on any improvements. That's just communication. We do that all the time and establish financial policies and procedures. This isn't, don't think of this as governmental policies and procedures, this is financial stuff, operational stuff. How do you know if your mission is achieved? What measures, metrics, indicators do you employ? Does it include an equity lens for assessment? All of our performance in, in the finance department is tied to charter responsibilities. Um, you know, developing a balanced budget, to me, that's, I mean, that's one way to measure it. We have to do that. That's kind of meeting what our, what our goals are. You know, some of this stuff, assisting departments, I like to do that. I think it helps them when you can help a department. That's kind of meeting our goals and helping them achieve. That's a metric I like to look at. Um, monitoring budget to actual, we do that every month. And if things come up, we like to communicate with departments, try to help them find solutions, work with them to find solutions. Um, and meeting other charter deadlines. That's really how we measure our performance and how we're doing is making sure we get everything done when it's due. Same thing continued. Um, we've got a, we're a member of the, our, a lot of people are and we report to the Government Finance Officers Association. Uh, there are standards that set out for the budget book performance and completion. Um, there's a lot of different standards, it's several pages long. We've received that award for over 25 years, which means we're meeting the standards of our profession. Um, so I think that's a good thing that we're meeting those standards. So that kind of validates that what we're doing is, is, is within it, with what we're supposed to be doing. Um, I think the biggest and important thing, I think this is probably what you guys need to hear from, from us in the finance department is the policymakers establish policies. We don't do that. We're implementers of it. Now, yeah, we, we can help assist how we're going to measure this and how we're going to do it, but really that's, that's going to come from outside of the finance department. You know, the mayor's going to set priorities and that's going to trickle down. Or the council's going to have their own priorities and that's going to trickle over to us. But it's really, those are the people that do that. It's not really us. Um, like last year, what were the, what were the, for 18, what were the mayor's priorities? Education, transit, infrastructure, affordable housing and the homeless, public safety, community economic development. We had specific measures tied to each department's budget request that track that so we can measure how many people submitted by what category. And we can report on that if necessary. So that was something else that we did. How are both the goals and the metrics of success communicated to the public? 
The budget is clearly a public document made widely available to constituents. Our balance sheets and performance measures also available. Y yeah, we report, everything is online. I'm gonna have a link, a page of links at the end of this, which you guys, have, if you've read ahead, you've probably already seen it. Uh, the budget message, the budget meeting, the council, you know, we've got budget books that go back to 1992, I think, online. We've got hard copies going back to 19 before that, before we, when you started, I think, in 72, I think. <laughs> yeah, we got to keep at least one. Uh, but we, we keep all that stuff, budget ordinance. All that stuff is online. We keep all of it online for the, for the city, for all the citizens to go out there and look. Since you brought up balance sheets, and you guys know we don't, you don't budget in balance sheets. But so you can see that information. Um, there's a CAFRS online in the Department of Finance. Uh, we got quarterly reforms reports that we submit to council that requested it. We have monthly bar reports that do budget to actual. I'm sure Mel has brought that up to you guys maybe, and you guys have your own internal reporting. Uh, there's the open data portal. There's a lot of different information out there. Uh, Balancing Act, which we've said for the first time, I think, or second time, um, that we're going to go over. Uh, that's something that's new. We're gonna, I'm going to look at it a lot closer here in a minute. Um, but that's where people can really engage outside of the Department of Finance and departments. Citizens can actually engage. And, and we'll get to that in a second. We're actually going to have a little demonstration. Uh, and then we have a revenue manual out there that defines all the sources and uses of revenue and where it all goes. And here's something. Can you guys see it okay? I think you can probably see it. This is, your, this is the Human Relations Commission. This is some of the stuff that goes in the budget book. The one off to the, to the left there is basically just to add a glance. That's just going to have budget information. The second page is, would be your program page. It talks about your different programs. The third one would be your more financial. And there's a, there's a couple more pages I just didn't include it because it would just gotten too, too convoluted. But we've got your FTVs. We've got a lot of different things in there. Okay, and we work with departments. This is, a, this is a kind of a standard format that all departments use. So performance reporting kind of could change over time and, and, that, and that would become a bigger section or a smaller section. But this is a standard kind of format. So you, if you were to go to you know, say, hey, I really want to add this, this, and this, we're gonna tell her no. Because there's a standard format that everybody, so everybody's comparable the same way. But you can go out to the, the finance website and go pull, pull up the stuff. I'm sure you guys have at some point. Um, but it's all out there, OK? Next question, what challenges do you have in carrying out your mission for all the people of the city? Uh, you remember that we work for the mayor and the council, so that, that process right there is we don't set our own policies. So it does come from somebody who's elected to represent their constituents. Um, we make all the information available online as soon as it's final, as soon as we can, okay? Um, Balancing Act, again, that, that, that's going to be something we're going to use. Um, the council has public hearings. Uh, you can attend live. You can watch Metro 3. You can watch this. Um, there's even uh, archived videos out there. I hope that everybody had a chance to go out there and review the, the videos that we had. That was my... I think first month I had to come in and do those videos, so that was fun. Um, but we don't provide direct other, I'm going to kind of put in quotes, other services to the public. I mean, everything that everybody does in the government is public service, but I, we don't interact with the public, um, except for stuff like this, I think. Uh, we don't, you know, as a budget officer, I, I, I work with departments. Uh, we represent the public, I guess is one way to say it. How can you guys help us meet our equity inclusion goals? Again, policymakers drive the overall goal for us. Um, we prepare the budget to meet those goals. We help them. Um, be aware of where you guys can engage, I think, is the biggest thing. And I've talked about that, is interaction with council. Um, you guys have this committee. There's a lot of things you can do there. Um, I guess the good question is where do you think you can be more? And can we help you do something? I don't, can we? I don't know. That's a question to you guys. How can citizens learn more, engage, and assist? Again, I, I think 
it's, it feels like the finance department's a little closed off sometimes. Uh, technology now, I think that the balancing act that we're going to show you here in a second um, is going to, I think it's that first step to really allowing people to get in there and see. Um, it's going through a software upgrade, so I don't know where it is status-wise, but the, the last year you had to go in there and change it by a percent. Well, that would mess it up because you couldn't really change anything else by that exact same amount, so it's kind of clunky. Uh, the new one, you can actually change it by increments of dollars, so therefore you can go in there and you can increase, I want to increase this budget by $100,000. You are gonna have to take it from somewhere because you've got to balance the budget, so where are you gonna take it from? So that kind of sets that, it helps I think visualize when you can actually see it and kind of do it yourself. Um, again, uh, you know, more people are engaged, reviewing council meetings, videos, viewing videos, watching Metro Theater. I think it's better for everybody. And here's an example of the entry page into Balancing Act that we're going to go into in a second. Uh, but a little bit about it. What is it? Balancing Act is an easy way for people to learn about their budget and make choices. Uh, it's just a really good way to go. I, you can sit at home and do it. I, can you do it on your phone? I think you can even do it on your phone. Um, so, I mean, it's a really way, a good way for you to, to play around with the budget during this process. Um, you can try to do make your own budget decisions and move things around. You can move a million dollars over to the Human Relations Commission. Where are you going to take it from? Uh, but it only focuses on general funds. So we're going to exclude... For right now, I mean, I think down the road there's going to be improvements that you can do this. But right now it's going to exclude things like water services and all the enterprise funds. They're not included in this, so you're only dealing with the general fund departments. What are the sources of revenue? Where does it go? Um, I thought that this might be interesting mm -hmm. for you guys to see. Um, 2018 revenue, which is equal to expenses, is $2.2 billion. The majority of those funds were derived from the following. Property taxes, a little over a billion. That's 45% of the revenue. Local option sales tax, 413 million. That's 19%. Other government agencies, 420. That's also 19%. I think when you talk budget, you have to talk about revenues, you have to talk about expenses. Again, 2.2 billion. The majority of those funds are spent on the following. Education. 879 million, that's 40% of our budgets on education. Law enforcement and care of prisoners, 261 million, 12%. Debt service, 281 million. So those are some of the big players. Okay, I'll leave that up for a second. But it's, it's kind of interesting when you look at it, you say, where is our money going? I think a tool like that, like Balancing Act, when we go to look at it, I think you can kind of see that a lot clearer. So I think it is, that's why I keep talking about this tool. I think it's good for people to look at. When can we use it? We can use it now, but it's, for, it's gonna be for fiscal 18. Um, as soon as the mayor is recommended budgets filed, we're gonna update it. And it's gonna, it's gonna be done, I think probably the next day, I think we can get it done. It'll be done the next day. It's gonna reflect what's in the ordinance, okay? Anytime after that, you guys can go out there. Anybody can go out there around the country. I think you had to enter in your zip code. It tells you when you let's say you're ISP, so if you're in Atlanta and you're actually filling it out, when I get a form back, it will say a participant in the Atlanta area has filled it out. So that way, when I make a report, I can say X amount of people in Nashville has looked at this, while we had two or three people in Atlanta look at it as well. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we can tell. We're you know we. I, I don't know if other people need to be coming in on our budget, but they can. Um, you can move expenses around, look at things. Um, you can't increase or decrease debt service and operating transfers, okay? That, because you can't change debt. That's a, a commitment that has to be paid. Um, you can, once, once you submit it to us, we're going to gather that information. I, I don't know what we're going to do with it yet because if we only get five people that have done it, which we'll have a lot more than that, but. What, there's no it's not going to tell us a lot. If we have a thousand people that have gone in there and done this, then we're going to have to we're going to look at it, try to figure out a way to report that, and maybe communicate it. And once the final budget is, is whatever that is, well, you know, if it's one adopted by the mayor ultimately or the council, we're going to update and have that in there too. 
Here's the links. For you guys have got that. I sent it, I sent it to them all electronically. It's in a PDF. All the stuff is out there. Department of Finance. It's just uh, there's lots of ways you can get lost in the Department of Finance when you start getting into the budget stuff. But everything I've discussed is out there. There's links to all this stuff. You go out there and look at it. Okay, um, Dustin, you want to come up here and do the? There you go. So this is a balancing act. And as we had previously mentioned, where it says, where does the money go? The pie chart actually shows you the departments and where the money actually goes. So when we were discussing one of the biggest receivers of our funds is the education, you can see that 879 million actually goes towards education. Also, if you go to your right, you can see law enforcement being 200, 263 million. What you need to be aware of is, for balancing that, it represents the ordinance. It looks like the ordinance. So you have two areas for expenditures for the general fund. You have GSD, which is the general service district, and you have USD, which is the urban service district. So when looking at the columns on the right-hand side, you're going to actually see some areas that may be repeated, not necessarily repeated, but shown twice. So if you're coming over to the right-hand side, you can see the law. We click on it, and you can see where law enforcement, care of prisoners, police department receives 192 million, sheriff's department receives 70 million. If you go on down, you keep on seeing general service district, and then you'll hit the urban service district. So if you look at urban service districts, law enforcement, care of prisoners, you have $481,000 that would go to police. So you do see the two distinct areas for expenditures as well as revenue within this. Now going back, if you're wanting to increase or decrease, as Tony had mentioned, right now, starting on Wednesday, knock on wood, should it be finalized, everything be incremented by $100. So when we budget, we budget by $100. We don't budget down to the nearest penny. So right now, if you were to increase or decrease this police department protection, you can see that if I increase it, it does it by percentage rate. So coming Wednesday, it'll do it by the nearest 100. That also makes it up here at the top where it says you are in deficit. It makes it a whole lot easier to come back into balance because if I go down to where it says urban service district, fire and prevention and control, when I decrease it to try to get it back into balance, it's a little bit harder. So starting on Wednesday, this aspect will be a whole lot easier for all the citizens of Davidson County to use. Now, if you're looking at the department's expenditures, and we go back up to the top, click on fiscal administration, you can see there's finance. You can click on it. It tells you our mission statement. It tells you more details. And it tells you where you can learn about the department, the contact information, and how to actually get in contact with each department. So if you go on to another department, such as the assessor of property, click on the information, you have their mission statement, more details such as contact information, and a link to their website. Now, if you scroll down to the bottom, we had discussed the debt service. Debt service cannot be increased or decreased because that is already set. So when you click on it, it tells you information as far as debt service and how to get more information on it. Now in regards to revenue, revenue is on the left-hand side, and you can see where the biggest part of it is property tax. You click on it, it tells you the source of revenue for the government is property tax. Go down to local option sales tax, and it tells you the same. Now for local option sales tax, when you click on it, it will tell you what the growth is projected from FY17, and it will also give you a link to the videos that OMB used to help convey what the office management budget does during the budgetary process. Now, for those that are interested in your department, you are actually part of general services, and you all fall underneath the ordinance as social services. So if I scroll up, there's the social services. We click on it, 
and there's the Human Relations Commission with your $491,900 budget. So if I try to increase it or decrease it, I can at that point in time. When a citizen increases or decreases a budget and once it gets into budget, they can actually have, and right now it's not on here because we're not soliciting the information. Oh yeah, it is, there it is. Um, you can actually hit the submit feature and it will submit me a report that somebody has submitted the information for me to compile it at a later date. So when the ordinance is filed come April 30th and the system is updated to reflect the mayor's recommended budget, then anybody who inputs any information at that point in time will automatically send me an email, let me know that they have input that information in. And what, what, um, what's the goal? Like, what, what are you going to do with that data? Looking at the data, I'm hoping to actually compile it to a report that will be sent to the budget director the, and the finance director so they can actually see what it is going on. And then they can use that information when the council hearings are going on, as well as council discussions, to convey what has been sent to us. It should be noted that the first year this was used, we actually broke the servers for this corporation. <laughs> we had so much input that was coming through. Um, looking at it for the long run, we have a small knit community that uses a balancing that. San Antonio is looking at breaking that record this year and then I'm looking at taking it back later on. So they are in the process right now of actually updating that information for, on their end. So they're going to be doing the trial and errors, finding the bugs because this is being updated to the newest platform and then we'll be using it for this fiscal year. And it, is there, is this like a vendor? So you say there are other communities that are using this, so. This is a subscription service, yeah. so Colorado's using it, as uh -huh. well as Denver, Pittsburgh, San Antonio. Uh -huh. So right now, my benchmarks are Pittsburgh and San Antonio. And do you know if they offer this um, in Spanish, for instance? San Antonio used it for Spanish for last year. They only had one submittal in Spanish, mm -hmm. so they are taking a break from it, and they are going to be looking at it again to see where did they actually miss that target before we're recommending it to other municipalities. Yeah. So yes, that has been looked at. San Antonio did use it, but they only had the one response. So they're looking at a way to engage that public. This is it, so I'll turn it back over to Tony. Okay. Thank you. How many other languages can it be in? Is it just Spanish? I know we've yeah. talked about this before. It can be in any language that is needed. We did ask if it could be in Kurdish, since we do have a large Kurdish-speaking population. They said it could be translated into it. However, we are looking at our peer city of San Antonio to see where the pitfalls are as well as the success is before we start looking at other areas. Yeah, this is kind of our marketing pitch too. Mm -hmm. So we've used this as a, this opportunity because if a lot of people view this, I think this is it's a way that people interact and we can communicate. Do you have a question? No, I have a comment on that. Yes. Just, um, from working with the Hispanic market for 27 years, you don't want to translate something before you engage with a community. So don't yeah. start there. Okay. If you are actually going to do this in Spanish, you need to create a relationship with the community, you know, engage them in a whole process before you spend money Easy translating guys. a tool, especially online tool that Latinos do not use. We don't answer surveys online. We don't like to communicate online. We like the human touch. Um, so this is more for acculturated Latinos like myself, but there has to be an engagement before going online. So don't use our money for that, please. <laughs> I, I think that also speaks to, you know, when you ask, like, how can the yeah. Relations Commission When we do you, this, we might get with you. Right, that, right, that we have um, at this table this, like, really deep wealth of information about how to engage constituents. Um, so I guess if you guys have seen this, I guess officially, questions? Yes, okay, so we are at the point for questions. Okay. Officially. 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 <laughs> and all three of us, I mean, it, it depends who's going to answer. I mean, it could be any one of us. Okay. You ask us. So. One general one. And the general one relates to the underpinnings that, that go into making the budget. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing you say that you, you process 
the budget after policy is set. Correct. So the policies, the underpinning, because budgets are, are, are value judgments. They, and, and they, they, are, they tell us how money is being spent mm -hmm. based on the wishes of those people driving the underpinnings of the budget. Fair statement. So when we want to engage, I understand this process. I'm going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. I can already tell you who's going to be mad at me. I didn't put my phone number on there, did I? So you think, no, I'm just kidding. But I'm back to the process because yeah. the community wants to have its voice in the underpinnings that drive the budget that you deliver. So you're, you're suggesting to us and the public that the appropriate place to have that conversation is with our city council. Uh, yeah, if you if you call me, I, I can't. I understand. I can't set that policy. I can. G might be able to jump in too. Let me, uh, let me step in for a minute because I get to get you back to my uh, <laughs> contention of our citizen centric uh, thing. You're exactly right, uh, Metro Council. Uh, that's one of the <coughs> benefits. Some people say it's not a benefit of a 40 member council. Uh, that means we have 35 districts. You've got roughly, I think I asked somebody this morning, it was like 17,000 residents or how, I don't know whether it's residents, voters, whatever, but the size of the district is roughly 17,000. So with 35 council members, you have a lot of direct input. So it, it's available to engage those folks on a personal level within your district and any of your constituency to do that. But then the, it, it goes further than that in the sense that uh, those council people have public hearings and listening sessions. So engagement just on general, as we, we were talking about general policy, what do you, uh, the planning commission and their efforts uh, to develop the uh, plans for each district is a way to set a policy of what you want the district to look like and you have input there. Uh, but even beyond that, Metro set up, and this is where I get to the citizen district and the participation opportunities that we have in the probably just a little over 32 commissions, boards, and authorities all of which have people like yourselves managing or making policy decisions for those agencies. And so that is a place of engagement even to a lower level or to a, I don't know whether you call it a lower or, or, or a higher level, but to where the real decisions are coming on how they allocate their money and spend, spend on. Uh, and they're all having regular meetings, they're all posted, they're having listening sessions, so all of that is a place where why I think this is really a haven for citizen activism and engagement and government participation and, and interest. So that's why I stand by, why I make my let me, Yeah, let me throw a little quick comment too. I was in a department, and I've seen it from the department side, and I didn't really get involved a lot with what was going on in the budget process when council's having their hearings. But sitting up next to everybody and being involved in it, the council does get involved with a lot of stuff. I didn't really realize how, how much they do. They really are engaging. So if you guys become interested and you do that connection, they will. I mean, they're constantly up there talking to us about stuff. So it, there is a huge amount of communication that goes on. Okay? To the point of very interested in this work and your opportunity to give citizen participation in budgeting mm -hmm. and thinking about that and you mentioned some models San Antonio Denver and other places did the city also consider models of participatory budgeting exemplars being say Vallejo San Jose where there's an entirely different model of citizen engagement that there is a topic there are a number of persons who apply to be convened and they go through an iterative process. So rather than having 100 citizens sitting at their various ISPs, mm -hmm. toggling in and out, 
they are actually coming together. Was that considered and weighed with this? I'm just wondering I think how that happened. There's a couple things. I'm just in I have to jump in a little bit. Um, sometimes we try to compare ourselves to similar government structures. We're a metropolitan government. Okay. You know, city managers type of structure of government is going to be different. Uh, we've got a lot of council members. Uh, so we, we look at that. Um, we just looked at the group we looked at and mentioned because they were using Balancing Act as a way of through, through just connecting that way. So to answer your question is no, those, those other cities. We try to keep it within peer cities that we normally consider ourselves being like at some level. Like when we do stuff like this, um, we try not to be not comparable to somebody, especially in the structure, population density, this, things like that. So I, I, don't, I think that may have answered your question. Uh, and just a quick note, too. What you described reminds me to a large extent of our res resilient cities efforts, uh, where they had that engagement of large groups of the community. Now, we haven't used it budgetarily per se, but that level of input is occurring and will filter down. But so, yeah, we're familiar with it and, and understand. I was just wondering, because there is scholarship in a number of jurisdictions around the country that are particularly looking at participatory budgeting, mm -hmm. and this seems similar but different, and I was just wondering if that had been brought into discussion as well. I just wonder if but you your answer is very helpful to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, going to Commissioner Ali. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, thank you for the presentation. Sure. It was really, really uh, great, very informative. And Gene, congratulations on being in this. This is 1972, I guess. Mean, you've seen a lot. Um, so yes. I did pick up on the very first few minutes when you were presenting that you said um, the finance department's in transition. Um, and I didn't, maybe I should know, but I didn't quite know what you meant by that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and it, it sounded a little graver than <laughs> what it was. Uh, it's more <clears throat> who's taken on different roles okay. since the new administration came in. And Tony's new to the budget officer role, but he's certainly not new to government. Uh, I'm not new to the, <laughs> the administrative role, but I'm preparing to exit the premises. Okay. And so I'm developing uh, resources to fill in there, and then uh, we've had a couple other staff changes, so it's more where we're headed. And it was more just to explain, okay. Okay. Tony could handle this by himself, right. but I, I enjoy doing it, and it gives, like I said, it gives me a chance to tell y'all a little bit about myself. Thank you. Um, on the requirements, is every department re is every department required to submit a budget on an annual basis? They don't get one. They just do what they got last year. So yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, they have to. Okay. If they don't. I mean, we we don't. We could just roll their last budget they submitted forward, and they don't get any improvements if we're accepting improvements. Okay. That year. So, so is yes, it my understanding that this year the mayor's not having hearings on the budget, or no, she is. No, she is. Oh, okay. The, everybody's received invitations. They okay. start March 19th. But I think what she might be speaking to is we're not submitting budgets in the manner that we did last year. Okay. You're right. It's not exactly the same way. Typically, in a typical year, you'll go in and we call them budget modifications. Mm -hmm. You'll submit your modifications to your budget. This year, we put some filters on that, only accepting it for these criteria. Mm -hmm. So it really cut back on the amount because we really were starting off, which we communicated, with the status quo budget or no increase to your budget, unless it's a regulatory thing, uh, contract increase. There were some specific things we called out where you could go back and request that. That didn't mean you got it. That means that we received it and reviewed it internally, and we're still doing that now. Okay. Okay. Mr. Foster had another question. That makes sense. Um, the specific question I wanted to ask you about the budget. Sure. Uh, pretty big percentage of dollars allocated for debt service. Um, the general public really does not understand, nor do I, That's so true. I'm speaking okay. as part of that general, what that debt service goes to pay. Are they bonds that were issued that we're, that we're obligated to? And if, what are those bonds issued for? And if we wanted bonds issued for things like affordable housing, 
that whole mm. process goes through city council. And is there a limit on how much our city can afford to take on in debt service? I can jump in and you can, okay. Um, that's a big question and that's actually what you I'm sorry, asked. But it's okay, I can address it. We don't know what it means. Yeah, I can address it. The, the, what you're asking for information wise is, is a lot. The projects, because that represents a lot of projects. Now, let me go in and explain just kind of the way, maybe a good way to approach it is just take a single project and then maybe kind of expand. Whenever there's different types of expenses, you have operating expenses, which are part of your operating budget that you guys have. There's also a 4% fund, which is part, is a funding source that you can use, which I call the in-between. It's not really capital, but it's not an operating expense. It's something that would be short-lived, but maybe expensive. Um, then there's things that are truly capital. In the accounting world, that's things that last, have a useful life of over 10 years, okay? Well, over one year, over $10,000. So it's got to be expensive. So when you're going to capitalize something, you want to, you're going to tie it to a bond issue probably. You're going to finance it through debt. That's where this debt service comes in. So if you have a $100,000 project and you take a $100,000 bond, like buying your house, you're going to finance it over 30 years. You're going to have an interest in principal payment. That's exactly the same principle that this is. Just stretched out over lots of projects over time. That's the debt service part of it. Yeah, uh, to answer your big question in a broad manner, debt service is paying the principal and interest on yeah. the money you borrow for whatever project it is, whether it's a highway, a bridge, a convention center, or whatever. And it's there until those projects are paid off, but as you know, there are other projects. Yes, it could be used for about affordable housing, let's say, you wanted to have a program where you were going to purchase uh, facilities and rehab, rehab them and, and use them for, yes, that would be a project that could be funded. Uh, again, that's where you get involved in the citizen input opportunities to try to say, well, what about a project here? Uh, as far as limits, uh, there, there's some limit on how much can be uh, by charter issued in the USD and the GSD is pretty much based on what the tax base would support given all your operating expenses and everything else. And have one more we thing. Reached you, that limit? And you're, have we reached Have one? we reached the limit you're referring to? No. Okay. Um, and one more thing to add. To, generally speaking, when you're going to bond something out, you have ownership in it. You're not going to put anything, you're not going to bond something out that you don't own, number one because it has to go on your balance sheet. So you're not going to do that. So if you did do an affordable housing thing where you're just kind of contributing, but it's not yours, I don't know if that would ever happen, um, you couldn't capitalize on it like that because it's not our asset. And you're not going to ever really, you really don't want to finance things over 30 years that only have a life of five years. Because why would you pay for something that only <laughs> lasts five years if you're for over 30 years? So there's, yeah. there's just some fiscal responsibility that we do. Okay. Go ahead. I don't know if the, my question relates directly to the topic or not. We normally hear nationally that budget disagreement and government shutdown. And if for some reason the mayor office and the council, there is disagreement in the budget, does that also apply to the metro government shutdown? I think, did you ask if we would ever get shut down? Yeah. It, uh, I, don't, I don't think that, no. remember, the rules are based on if the mayor presents a budget and council doesn't approve it, mm -hmm. mayor's gets accepted. Yeah. There's no shutdown now then. Yeah, no shutdown. Yeah, we wouldn't there, shut it down. There, there, there's two things in the charter that, that address that. One, one is, is that you have to have a balanced budget. So if, if we don't have the revenues to do it, you've got to either cut expenses or get, get the revenue. The second thing is, is when once the mayor submits it to the council, the council has until June 30th to adopt the mayor's budget or put a budget together within the revenues available by June 30th and adopt that. So that precludes the whole issue you're talking about. The national level, A, they're not worried about a balanced budget because they do deficit financing and then th there's no you know, the president's budget doesn't go in because Congress didn't. I don't think the federal government has actually had a 
budget like us in 12 years or something like that. So I'm not, I'm not talking balance. I'm just talking budget. <laughs> they just keep, budget. Do, they keep doing supplemental spending packages is what they keep doing. So that, that yeah. would make me a little nervous as a citizen, and it does. Okay. Um, <laughs> just big picture stuff. Are there other questions from the commission? Um, what, was there anyone that signed up to ask questions from our transmission? Yeah. Okay, very good. At this point, I will, turn, I will thank you very much for your presentation. Sure. I will turn this back over to our chair, Commissioner Holdren. Thank you very much. We thank you. Thank you. We thank you for this illuminating and informing presentation. You did meet, I think, the expectations and desires of the commission in specifically providing us with tools. And by being so kind as to ask, answer the questions we posed, those slides are probably some of the most powerful because they boil down succinctly, point by point, what citizens can be looking for when they're looking in a certain area and wondering about the funding and how to drill through. So your responses along with the links to the resources and this taped presentation are going to be invaluable and we thank you for your service. Thank you. I was giving Mel a hard time when we were talking about it. Right in the middle of budget season, I thought I said this is actually the best time to do it. Yes, and yeah. I said that. Yeah, I? Absolutely, okay. this is the best time to do it because right. everything's just getting started. So this is That's the right. time to do this. Yeah, thank you. you got it. With that, uh, we have yes. And I really, I really appreciate the candor about where it's best for citizenry to get involved in the budget process. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not just in the the the. the, the software we can add input in and, and but it's the encouragement that we need to be talking to our policy makers to make sure they're sharing with those of you carrying out the budget that our values are reflected in that budget thank you so with no further comment uh, gentlemen you are welcome to remain for the rest of the meeting or to be dismissed at your leisure we will now turn to the executive director's report for the 15 minutes we have remaining great um i will actually start with a, a, a budget update of my own um as tony said um budgets um, will be submitted a little bit differently this year. Um, we do have one very, very small um, contractual increase um, that we've included. That's our, our rent is going up um, very slightly. Like it's $600 over the, the whole fiscal year. So um, other than that, um, the instructions for departments were to submit, you know, it's just a flat budget from this past year. Um, there is, however, um, right this minute, um, as you probably know, the council um, allocated a supplemental to, um, to the hospital, to general, and um, Departments, including ours, are being asked to find ways um, to save for this fiscal year. There's four months left. <laughs> um, and so we've been given some savings expectations. Um, I believe it's clearly a negotiation. Um, I will say that the initial ask um, was uh, 75,000, I'm, I'm sorry, we have $75,000 in our total budget for programming. Every other penny in our budget is fixed costs. That's salary, um, fringe, rent, um, IT services. So every bit of programming that we carry out in our office, um, all office supplies, um, everything that is, arguably um, discretionary comes out of that just about $75,000. So um, last week uh, we were told that salary ex or the savings expectations um, 
for our department was around $45,000 um, without cutting deeply, deeply cutting programming for the next four years, for the next four months. Um, I'm not entirely sure that we can meet that savings expectation. I'm sorry, do you have to save 45000 like not use $45,000? Right, that's the request. Um, I did, sub my staff, particularly Mark and I, did a hard look at what obligations we have for the remaining four months, um, what commitments we've already made. Mm -hmm. um, and I can find some savings. And I will also say that I think I personally, and I believe this commission generally, um, wants to do our part uh, with regard to the finances of the hospital. Um, so we are very committed to find savings in the remainder of our budget. Um, and I believe that we can keep our core programming for the next four months in place and still be able to save around $23,000. Um, Marissa, do you have a question yeah, about that? Yeah, um, you have the additional private fund. Is, can, can some of those programs be shifted to that fund? That's a very good question, and the answer is yes. Okay. In fact, I met with um, the, our community, uh, our support fund at the Community Foundation last week, um, requesting some funds um, to support the production of the next two pamphlets in our affordable housing. Uh, educational series, um, which I had intended to be done this fiscal year. Um, I'm also pursuing some private funding opportunities um, for uh, our IFTAR um, and perhaps even for uh, to support the additional mobile diversity seminar. Um, if you recall, we generally do two mobile diversity seminars for the police academy each fiscal year. Um, because they're running overlapping classes, um, this year we were asked to do an additional one. Um, so yes, I am pursuing those opportunities. And I think if some of those come through, it may be that we can have some additional savings. Um, but cutting, without cutting some programming um, and without additional funds, um, I believe that we can save somewhere around twenty three to $25,000. One, one question about the, the, the uh, home diversity. Uh, does, is it subsidized at all by the police budget? They, it is. Can they do more <coughs> or how, I mean, or has that been, has that been? Yeah, everyone's being asked for savings. Sure. And I, and I don't know the level at which other departments are being asked. I do know that the ask for us was um, admittedly aggressive. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's why I, I viewed it as a negotiation. Okay. Um, but yes, so the police department um, absolutely does share <laughs> costs with us for the mobile diversity seminar. Um, it, the, the bus. Um, they pay for the printing of the resource guide. Um, and so at the end of the day, I think both of us are paying about the same. The, my follow-up to that is that with regard to the, the support organization, mm -hmm. the 501c3, are, are, do they have that designation? Are they? Can they, and my, my question for that yeah. is for grant, uh, you know, pursuing grants or perhaps some kind of pass through, <coughs> something that we might be able to fundraise either through them, or yes. through the 501c3. Yes, so here's, um, and, and I had this very conversation with them last week as well, that we can do some fundraising for particular purposes, and if the, the and let me take a step back to say that the way that our support fund generally works is um, we can ask for up to 10% of the total fund each calendar year. So if, for instance, like now, there's $100,000 in that fund, like we can write requests to that board 
to fund things up to $10,000 for the year. However, we can also um, request that private um, fundraising, that if money is sent to the Community Foundation Fund, earmarked and specifically designated for a particular event or program, then the full amount of that that has been designated we can use. So, and that actually, um, to be honest, like that makes it a lot easier for my office too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because the way the fund works is, so let's say somebody wants to give $5,000 to yeah. support the IFTAR, then the community foundation in that fund, they pay the, they would pay vendors directly. So we, right. it, it does make it easier for us. Does it have to support a program or can it support the commission? If it is generally to support the commission, then it is governed by the rules of the fund, which would be we can get to, we can only ask, they can only pay out 10% of the corpus. And that's how the fund is replenished normally? Yeah, absolutely, that's how, yep. But they can take designated donations for earmarked specific for programs. specific programs, right? Which we would have access to the full amount. What is the cost of the police um, training, the diversity mobility? Um, we spend about three thousand dollars per. per. Now we also got a, an increase in our budget last year of six thousand dollars to support that very program. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, um, yeah, without that additional 6,000, we would be, it would be pretty tight this year. Um, speaking of the mobile diversity, unless there's other questions about just, that. Uh, just don't let us know if there's any steps we can take that yeah. would be of help in this process. Yeah, I definitely will. Um, I'm gonna. I'm set to have a meeting um, on March 16th to to discuss with, um, likely with Tony and our budget analyst. Um, you know where I think we are and where I think our savings can be found. There might be some hope that they will accept that as a fair contribution. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. Obviously, smaller budgets are greater, more greatly impacted. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean $45,000 is um, is over 50% of our discretionary funds, um, you know, at only four months left yeah. of the fiscal year. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty tough. Now yeah. if um, programming has to be cut, um, that is something that I think um, I would like to have a discussion with the executive board at the very least mm -hmm. about what you know, where priorities lie. Do you think the, that that number um, came from a calculation that was based on the discretionary? No, I, I, what my understanding is that um, they took the actual spending um, as of the end of December, so half of the fiscal year, and based expectations for the whole fiscal year on that number. The, the, the problem for us is that a, a lot of our spending and programming occurs in the second half of the fiscal year. So those departments that spent their money up front yeah. were, hit, uh, were hit less? Well, Probably. that's that's, that's presumably true. Yeah. And it's not a, you know. That's right, that's not me, how. You shouldn't get punished for not spending your money early. Well, I, I will um, I will diplomatically use every argument I can. Make. Yes. <laughs> yeah, happy, we're happy to argue. And you will with also you. use your executive committee for other ideas and maybe that's, formulate. That's exactly share. right. Yes. Did, did Thank you. Did you say that this was a four-year, four month? No, four, four, four month. This is like savings four for months. this current fiscal year. And this is won't happen again. Well, we don't I have know. no idea. We don't know. We don't know what our budget will be next year. No. Yeah, we don't know that no. yet. And it could be $45,000 less. Uh -huh. And my last <laughs> point is that's why I asked the question about 
budgets to departments are moral statements, not just fiscal statements. And that's the conversation we might want to be engaging in with those who make the policy that drive their work. I would also say just to put as an exclamation point on this issue, this is exactly why we have been so diligent to have conversations and frame our work around legislative mandates because there becomes, not only is there a moral imperative, but arguably there is also a legal imperative that when an agency or entity is cut below its ability to deliver its legal work, not just what we want to do, but what we may have to do on behalf of others. For example, if our Title VI compliance and training, et cetera, also is back in to the second half of the year, and it is not able to go forward, then there are different implications about cutting that. So it is not just a matter of we can't cut salaries or we can't cut debt service, but query whether legally mandated functions can be cut. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so powerful to know and own one set of legal mandates. Absolutely. And I'm sure your executive committee will take that conversation up. Great. Do season. Um, all right, I want to run through, um, we're at the end, but I do want to run through just a couple of other things. Mobile diversity seminars, like we said, uh, two of them coming up March 28th and June 13th. If you're interested and available, uh, we would welcome volunteers to assist, to participate. Uh, please let Barbara um, or I know if you're available on one of those two days. Um, the, the, we are working, we're starting work on the second part of our educational pamphlet series on the affordable housing crisis. Uh, I don't have a full outline yet. Um, we have a general focus um, that will be on evictions and displacements, um, reviewing the scale and impact of evictions and economic displacement, uh, barriers um, that the city faces to tenant, to greater tenant protections. Um, a decline in um, housing units available in Davidson County with a particular focus on the impact on families and children. And interestingly, I think I should point out that it comes kind of at a, at a critical time, right, when just this past week we learned that enrollment in Metro National Public Schools is down, which is pretty extraordinary if you think about the number of people that are moving into Davidson County. Um, so. So, sort of, you know, with also with um, enrollment at MMPS down, that's also um, the loss of significant federal funding attached to that. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's um, an interesting question, like what is driving that? Um, and I believe that many speculate that it's a result of gentrification that has pushed many families with children out of Davidson County. There was also a report a week ago about the amount of homeless students in our in our area. So if they're not if they're not homeless, they're not going to school. They're not in school. <coughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, so as we craft the final two pamphlets, we are um, including Adrian Harris, the head of the mayor's office of housing, in those conversations. Um, you know, we want to ensure that you know if there's a a strong educational message, you know, that she would want included. We want we want to consider that strongly. Avi, that first pamphlet is so good. Yeah, it's <laughs> as good a primer on a hard to understand topic as you'll find, and it's laid out just beautifully. Beautiful. So I shared it with leadership Nashville, and the feedback has been very positive. Great. I would encourage all of us to send out emails to our boards, our staffs, mm -hmm. our colleagues, friends, with the link to our website, because that link, it pops open really clear. Yeah. Yes. It's really. And we have um, www.housing101.us, which will have all three of the pamphlets. So the first one's on there now, and it's a, it's a really nice electronic version of it. So you can share it electronically um, with folks. Will you send this Dot US. I will send this out to the to the full commission. Um, 
The one last thing about affordable housing, um, the welcome home movement uh, launched last week um, with now over 40 organizational supporters. We expect that there'll be many more um, in the next couple weeks. I'll send you a link that you can all share again with your networks. Um, but we have these old palm cards. Um, also, as you may recall, I'm part of a team that submitted an application for the All Cities Initiative, um, my policy link um, with the mayor's office. Um, addressing policies to avoid or mitigate displacement uh, due to gentrification. We were selected as one of the finalists, which is really Yay. exciting. I know we were interviewed a couple of weeks ago and um, hopefully we'll know if Nashville has been selected as part of the, the that cohort uh, by the end of the month. Um, stand Against Racism. Um, we'll talk about this again in April, but I did just want to point out that you know we're co-sponsoring the event again this year, it, April 27th, and this time it's it's a two-day event, and so it's not just the gathering at the courthouse you know during the day, but we're also working um, with the organizers on developing a um, a youth summit on the 28th and Barbara has been really instrumental in helping the YWCA sort of craft um, what that summit is going to look like um, and she had some engagement with some youth on February 24th um, there'll be one more before the big summit um, but she's also been really instrumental in helping um, the YW and uh, other co-sponsors um, like connect with um, active partners. So she helped bring in the library. Um, who else did you get on board? Metro Arts. Oh yeah, Metro oh, Arts. Yeah, so Barbara's been really instrumental in growing the scope of the Stand Against Racism um, and sort of you know building its substantive message. Would you send me information about that? Are you looking for more people to participate, more groups? Okay. Um, and I believe I said last month we're we're working on uh, revisions to our website, updating old language, and um, when when I feel like it's worth announcing, <laughs> I'll be sure to to make that announcement. Um, and remember, our meeting in April is moved from April 2nd to April 9th. And thank you so much because I'm going to take the first week of April off. Yes. Well done. Just one quick. Thank you. You had mentioned yes. during the budget discussion uh, the FDAR. Is there any tentative date on that? <sighs> wow. Well, um, no. We, um, we are still in conversation with the Music City Center about a date, and uh, I'm really thankful to them for even, you know, considering accommodating um, and, you know, what they offer us. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we will have a date. Um, if it's at the Music City Center, we'll have it by the end of the week. Is but Ramadan, it? but it's during Ramadan, like which is, you know, like May, May fifteen to June fourteen or fifteen. Right, and it'll likely be near the end of okay. Ramadan. Are you concerned so about two budget? Quick announcements. Yes. <coughs> this is now ready. We, we've signed. Can, can we? Okay. Well, last thing. Just one last announcement. We've signed on as an organization but this is now ready for individuals. So if you don't mind sharing this website with your contacts, individuals can sign up now and support. And lastly, if you're available, would really enjoy having you at our Jewish Community Social Justice Center, which is the 13th. And you should have received another one of my pestering notes today. Got um, two. You got two? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you'll probably just get one more. So don't, yeah, it's don't really worry. wonderful. <laughs> but please sign up and join us. Thank you. And before we dismiss, I would just like to acknowledge representatives from the mayor's office, particularly uh, the mayor's office on New Americans. Thank you for coming. And if you need to have a word, you may Thank close. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Hopefully, I'll be here um, every month. Yeah.
Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So with that, if there are no other pressing new news or announcement, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.